Hi everyone, you're very welcome to today's discussion with Professor Peter Hayes at Trinity College Dublin, virtually. The School of Law is delighted to be co-hosting this event with the Department of History, um, and in particular with Dr. Patrick Houlihan, who is Assistant Professor at the Department of History and Director of the MPhil Programme in International History. My name is Donna Lyons, I'm with the School of Law, and this is Seminar 22 in our speaker series. So we're delighted to speak to Professor Peter Hayes today, who obtained his PhD in Yale in 1982 and specializes in the histories of Nazi Germany and the Holocaust, and in particular in the conduct of the nation's largest corporations during the Third Reich. He taught at Northwestern University for 36 years from 1980 to 2016, in the process winning the Weinberg College Distinguished Teaching Award, um, the Northwestern Alumni Association Excellence in Teaching Award, and the Charles Deering McCormack Professorship of Teaching Excellence, the university's highest honor for teaching. The recipient of numerous research fellowships, Professor Hayes has also served on the academic boards of multiple professional societies and Holocaust Memorial sites, including as chair of the Academic Committee of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum from May 2014 to May 2019. So the subject of our discussion today is Professor Hayes's forthcoming book, Profits and Persecution, German Big Business and the Holocaust, and that will be published with Cambridge University Press. So in this forthcoming book, Professor Hayes traces the ways by which the German corporate world became deeply implicated in and in many respects indispensable to the Nazi regime's persecution, exploitation and murder of Europe's Jews, and argues that these developments stemmed inexorably from decisions made and actions taken in 1933 at the very outset of Nazi rule. So just to open the discussion, um, I, I wonder if you would like to talk a little bit more about the research and the ideas put forward in this forthcoming book, Professor Hayes. Thank you very much for taking an interest in my work. Um, I have been working on this particular topic uh, for about 25 years. And before I started on this particular book, I wrote a history of the IG Farben Corporation, which opened up to me the, the access point that business gives you to understanding how German society was corrupted in the period of no, between 1933 and 1945. And I suppose the theme of everything I've done is to desensationalize this topic, to have us approach it in all of the complexity that struck the people at the time as they were living through it. One way of capturing this, I think, is to look at what happened with the boards of directors of two companies, about which I have each, in each case, written a book, uh, IG Farben and Degosa. These were two chemical firms located in the city of Frankfurt, right? In fact, on opposite sides of the old, old quarter of Frankfurt. One was a very large organics chemical producer, that's IG Farben, and Degusa was a very large inorganics chemical producer, concentrated on metals and so forth. In 1933, these, when Hitler came to power, these two corporations had between them about 45 members of their managing and supervisory boards. Not a single one, was a member of the Nazi party. IG Farben had made a small contribution in 1932 to the Nazi party, but then that was at the first elections of 1932, and then not repeated that in the second elections. It was as if they had kind of backed off from a flirtation. The heads of these two companies thought that the economic policies that the Nazis indicated they were going to adopt were unlikely to be good for them because they were both companies oriented toward export markets and so forth. Flash forward to 1943, 10 years later, both of these companies are literally up to their elbows in Nazi criminality. They are both employing slave labor. They are both employing slave labor from the Auschwitz concentration camp because IG Farben built a factory three miles east of Birkenau. Um, Degussa built a factory about 15 miles up the road in a town called Gleiwitz. They were, the, product they were making, the products they were making at these factories were complementary. They were to make rubber tires uh, and Degussa made an additive to the rubber tires that increased their durability. So it was a military product. They both um, were involved in therefore producing for the German war effort. And the key thing here is they were partners in the company that made Zyklon. That is the gas that was used at Auschwitz to kill people. 
How do you get from 1933, where neither of these firms is particularly aligned with the Nazis and in favor of them taking over the German government to 1943, when both of these firms are active participants in the persecution of Jews. And that's the dramatic, the arc of the story that I tried to tell both in the micro form of these individual companies and in this book in the macro form. And I've arrived over the years at uh, not so much with the individual companies, but certainly with the overall trajectory, I've arrived at a kind of uncomfortable position for a historian. Because we like to emphasize contingency. We like to say, you know, things didn't have to go the way they went. But in this case, I've come to the conclusion over time that key decisions that were made early in 1933 literally threw the switches as the German phrase goes, for almost everything that happened afterwards. And German industrial leaders in 1933 made fateful mistakes in dealing with the Nazis that they never could reverse, that they in fact took the first steps on the slippery slope before the Nazis even knew what they were going to do with the Jews of Germany or Europe. And once they had taken these steps, they were irreversible. Um, in a sense, the leaders of German industry engaged in a kind of appeasement of the Nazi regime in the first six months of 1933. And the way they appeased the Nazi regime was to abandon their Jewish co-workers, their Jewish directors, their Jewish employees. Um, and this process began in the first six months of Nazi rule and then gathered strength inexorably over the following months. And so, for instance, by the middle of 1934, well over half the Jewish members of the managing and supervisory boards of the 300 largest firms in Germany had lost their positions in, in the span of 18 months. In the first six months, the figure is one third for managing board members and a quarter for supervisory board members, which are more honorific titles. In other words, when the Nazis assaulted German industry and basically demanded that these people be removed, in most cases, German industry immediately capitulated. And having done that, it had very little ability thereafter to resist what you might call the siren song of self-interest, uh, because as Jews were more and more put under economic pressure in Nazi Germany, they presented, if you will, more and more opportunities to German firms to acquire their assets. German firms acted increasingly to, to do that, either out of acquisitive motives, they wanted to expand their operations, or defensive motives. They didn't want to lose market share to competitors. And one of the stories of my book is that competition corrupts. That once the political context was created of persecution by the Nazi regime, and in the early years, what the Nazis did is they encouraged Jews to leave by various forms of pressure and to sell out their assets. They didn't require it. And they encouraged non firms that were owned by non-Jews to acquire the assets of Jews, but they didn't enforce it. The transition to enforcement comes in November, 1937. But up until that point, there's a, there's a gathering process by which the individual interests of German corporate executives become increasingly to participate in the persecution. And then after the enforcement phase starts with various restrictions on foreign exchange, um, access to raw materials of any firm in which Jews have a significant presence, that is a single manager or 25% of the shareholdings. That, that virtually drives Germany's Jews out of economic life in the course of 1938. And then what happens is corporations become absolutely willing they, they are responding to economic pressures, but they're willing to become the transmission belts for the seizure of all the assets of Germany's Jews. They, the insurance companies become willing to monetize the insurance policies owned by Jews and then to collect that money for the German state to confiscate. The banks play the same role. They are willing to freeze the bank accounts of Jews to restrict as the government orders what Jews can take out of those accounts and then to transmit to the government all the assets that the government claims. Um, that is the, the, right, the right flight tax, if you were 
fortunate enough to get out of the country, 25% of your assets were to go to the state. The state didn't have its own mechanism for confiscating that money. So it turned to the banks and said, hand over to us 25% of the bank deposits of the Jews. And the same thing happens with their safe deposit boxes and so forth. And then the next stage is they become indispensable participants in the confiscation of the assets of Jews in annexed countries. So that when you have, by the time the Nazi regime starts cracking down in the protectorate of Bohemia and Moravia, and decides first it is going to round up all of the Czech Jews, take them to a little town called Theresienstadt, and then gradually sh ship them out to the death camps in the east. And then that is followed by the roundup of the Czech Jew, uh, of the Jews of, the, of, um, of Germany who are prominent and they are sent to Theresienstadt. And as a precondition of them being allowed to live there, they have to hand over all of their fungible assets to the Reich. Where do these assets go? The Reich deposits them, first in the case of the Czech Jews, second in the case of the German Jews, in the branches of the Deutsche and Dresdner Bank that are in Prague. And, they, and so what happens is these banks become, the, they are collecting the deposits as capital with, that they can work with, and they become the biggest creditors to the SS. And this business, in the case of the Dresdner Bank, amounts to about 10% of their lending income from 1941 to 1940, the end of 1944. Not an overpowering amount of money, but an appreciable amount of money. And this is the story of the active involvement of a host of corporations, Allianz in ensuring SS enterprises at concentration camps, Degussa in processing the gold and the, the silver that's plundered from Jews all over Europe and sent back to the Reichsmark. All of them don't make a great deal of money on this, but they are willing to be, in effect, the executors of the persecution process, largely not out of, out of greed, but out of a kind of political jockeying for position uh, on the part of individuals within the companies who exercise important roles, or on the part of the companies themselves competing with others. So this is a continuation of the process having initially capitulated to the Nazi demand that you fire a category of people and then gradually become the profiteers off their flight and then becoming the servants of their persecution. And then ultimately the corporate executives become the true embodiments of the banality of evil because behind all of this, in a way, in, in a way that of course Eichmann was not the the embodiment of the banality of evil. He was deeply committed to what he was doing. And the banality that Hannah Arendt defined was thoughtlessness, was a refusal to understand the consequences of your actions for other people. Eichmann understood the consequences of his actions for other people. He relished it. These corporate executives don't consider that at all. They always consider in a myopic and indeed somewhat mundane way, um, their self-interest. What is, the, what is their gain or loss from refraining from the persecution or participating in the persecution? And thus they become the truly thoughtless participants in this. And they are emblematic in that respect of a great deal of German civilian society. They are in fact, you know, the, the, the textbook case of the way in which the persecution of the Jews became a societal project. So that's what I, set out to try to account, to, to, to recount, so that people will have a sense of almost, if you will, the seductive nature of participation that operated within Nazi Germany. And I left out one thing that I wanted to say earlier, that there's a starting point for this. This is not a story about anti-Semitism. It's a story about the way in which mundane, as I said, myopic motives get activated in an anti-Semitic context to do terrible damage. But there is an element of anti-Semitism at the beginning of the story, which had fateful consequences, and which is also something highly relevant to our world today. And that is that while German executives, the, the greater part of these people whose records we can trace in 1933, were not fervent anti-Semites 
they were kind of tepid anti-Semites. That is to say, they would not defend Jews as a category. They would defend distinguished colleagues who were the head of merchant banks, let's say, or people with whom they had rubbed shoulders in life. They knew that German industry was not dominated by Jews in 1933. They knew that the Nazi depiction of Jews was a caricature. But they did harbor hostility to some Jews. And this meant that when the Nazi onslaught occurred in 1933, the defense that was offered was very half-hearted. It was some industrialist, Karl Friedrich von Siemens, the man who was the head of the firm that bore his name, did speak about how wrong it was to persecute people who have lived here in this country for hundreds of years and have been good patriots. But it was okay to persecute new immigrants who had the Jews who had come into the country, mostly around the end of World War I. Uh, there were about 100,000 of them. They made up 20% of the German Jewish population. They were Ostjuden. They were traditional Jews, often dressed in kaftans and so forth. And this aroused fears. There, I, can, I can cite four or five different contemporary documents in which German industrialists speak of the country being inundated, inundated with 100,000 immigrants. It was a psychosis. And therefore, when the Nazis attacked Jews, the German industrialists tend to say, well, there are good people who should be defended, but there are also these people who they are a problem. And as in addition to that group, there was one other group that Siemens and others half-heartedly defended. And that was what the people we would nowadays call the chattering classes. Um, the prevalence of Jews at the top of newspaper editorial offices playwrights, theater, in the arts world, uh, the, the position of Jews was very conspicuous. And these were often people who were critical of capitalism and industry. And industrialists resented it, and they wanted, and when the Nazis attacked those people, industrialists were very uh, reluctant to defend them. Uh, Siemens, in fact, wrote a letter around April 1st, 1933, the famous boycott day, in which he called these people edel Bolshevism, which is a very difficult word to translate, but it's something like cultivated communists. And they were people he thought deserved being rounded up and hushed up. And so the weakness of anti-antisemitism at the top of German industry meant that the defense of the human rights of Jews was from the beginning half-hearted and soft and very easy to overcome. So from that position of being, you know, not anti-anti-Semitic, but not being actively anti-Semitic, to then becoming the profiteers, to then becoming the executors, to then becoming the people who in effect acted as bagmen in American, I don't know if this translates very well, American gangster argot is bagmen and fences. The bagmen are the people who collect the loot, the fences are the people who sell it, who turn it into something marketable. And this is the, what German industry becomes. And it becomes this because of the initial tepidness of the response, then the dictates of capitalist competition, then the dictates of in a particular kind of capitalist state where politics matters a great deal to economic policy, the dictates of political competition. And at no point do industrialists have or feel they have a stopping point. Even in the worst things that happen, the the executives of the metal processing division of the Degusa company certainly know by 1944 at the latest where some of the gold and the silver coming into their smelteries is coming from. They certainly know that it's coming out of ghettos and, and camps and so forth. But how could they draw a line? Because in 1939, if, even if they had wanted to, because in 1939, they had agreed to process the gold and the silver that the Nazi state confiscated from the Jews of Germany in the aftermath of Kristallnacht. And they knew the compensation for being paid for that was very low. How could the managers of the company that made Zyklon, the subsidiary of uh, Degusa and Aji Farben was called Degesh. How could they turn down requests from the SS for Zyklon after they learned what it was being used for because they began providing Zyklon to the SS and to the concentration camps in 
1940, before the Holocaust began, because it was a fumigating agent for barracks. And once they were implicated in that, on what grounds were they going to say, we won't, we won't sell this to you anymore? So the, so the slippery slope had, be, had intensified even before the Holocaust begins. And when the responsible officials learn about this, they find no grounds for saying no, except of course, honor in the eyes of future generations if Germany lost the war, but no immediate grounds. And they found lots of reasons to say yes, because the patronage of the SS was politically useful. Planting that rubber factory at Auschwitz was a way of preserving IG Farben's monopoly on making synthetic rubber. Um, selling the Zyklon to the SS was, an, was an, a way of preserving the monopoly on that product. And thus, this is a story of how, in a particular context, capitalist competition individual desire for self-preservation or corporate desire for self-preservation, what the Germans call Bestandserhaltung, these became the dominant forces and drove these firms into ever more immoral behavior. Okay, that was a long-winded answer to your question, but I hope that situates uh, what I'm trying to do. And, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm trying to desensationalize and complexify our understanding without excusing these people's mm -hmm. behavior in any way. They, they were people who made terrible decisions very early in the face of the Nazi state, and then they compounded the terribleness of their actions all the way through. Thank you so much, Professor Hayes. It's fascinating. And um, Professor Houlihan is really an expert in this area. So I'll hand it directly over to you, Patrick, if you're happy enough to come in at that point. Well, thanks very much, Donna, although I'm hard, hardly an expert in these areas. But um, no, I want to th thank you for the opportunity of this forum and um, uh, thank, thank Peter for his uh, excellent uh, talk and really speaking with us on this uh, exciting research project. Peter, <clears throat> I mean, there's so many questions one could ask, but I, and I have several. But I mean, the one, one that leapt to mind right, right from the start is, um, I guess, what are the implications of your research uh, regarding the pan-European and global dimensions of the business history of the Third Reich beyond Germany, right? So, you know, if there's one thing we know, it's that corporations, right, since the days of the Dutch East India Company, don't respect national borders. So can you talk a little bit more about like how you see the implications of this research, um, businesses in Hitler's Germany and their relations? I mean, not only with say Mussolini's Italy or Patin's uh, Vichy France or um, yeah. even more globally, I, I guess expanding Hirohito's Japan or FDR's America, right? I mean, what are the transnational implications of this corporate responsibility? And it, even like, even for the USA, you know, the USA before December 1941, well, the Holocaust was underway before then, right? So, I mean, just, I, I wonder if you could speak a little bit more about kind of the pan-European and, and global um, aspects of the Third Reich's business history. Let me, let me start, you use the phrase corporate responsibility. And of course, nowadays the buzz phrase is corporate social responsibility. And clearly in this era, corporations did not conceive of themselves as having social responsibilities. They did conceive of themselves as having national responsibilities. And one of the things that ties together uh, corporations in Mussolini's Italy and Hirohito's Japan and, and Germany is the way in which they become enmeshed in serving national political goals, most of which in these cases are expansionist and militarist and so forth. But the phrase corporate response, social responsibility did call to mind uh, a contemporary issue. Um, I'm, I'm, this is gonna be a little delicate. I'm gonna to try to put this as carefully as I can. You remember when the events here in the States at Charlottesville occurred? Um, I had been asked on uh, inauguration day of Donald Trump to write an article for an online journal here called the Daily Beast about how Hitler came to power. For some reason, they saw a correlation between these events. And um, then when we get to Charlottesville, I saw a correlation between events because um, I, I sat down at my typewriter and I, I wrote an article that I thought I might be asked for the day after if all of the members of Trump's various business councils did not resign on the morning after Charlottesville, 
this would be analogous in my mind to some discussions that occurred in Germany in April 1933. And I drafted this article to show the analogy. Well, they all did resign in the United States the next day. And th this shows you how vital the non-action of German industrialists in early 1933 was because they were presented on uh, April 1st, 1933 is a day everybody remembers as the boycott of the Jewish shops. There was another event that occurred on that day. Otto Wagner, who was the head of the economic policy section of the National Socialist Party, appeared at the headquarters of the National Association of German Industry. There are different accounts saying whether he came with stormtroopers or didn't, but it didn't really make any difference to what happened. He appeared at the headquarters and he demanded that the National Association of German Industry fire its two principal business managers who were associated with liberal parties of the now defunct Weimar Republic and replace them, one with a Nazi and one with a nationalist ally fire all of their Jewish employees and um, basically tow the economic line of the party. At that very moment, the head of the National Association of German Industry, Gustav Krupp von Bohlen und Halbach, was in a meeting with Hitler. When he came back that afternoon and found out what had happened, he called Hitler and begged him to call off this stormtrooper demand. Hitler said no. And on April 5th, Krupp capitulated. He fired the Jews, he fired the managers. He had a presidium, a board, on which several people challenged him the next day and said, you shouldn't have done that. We should not kowtow to the political demands, which are in effect illegal at this point. And Krupp silenced them by saying, if you make me reverse my decision, I will quit. At which point the people who challenged him resigned from the board and his decision stood. Now, at that moment, they had basically said to the political leaders, we'll do whatever you want us to do, including fire our colleagues and so forth. That was the absolute turning point. Um, and I saw, at, so this is a matter of where corporate leaders, do they see themselves as having a wider social responsibility, a wider political responsibility? In the contemporary world, in the United States, what is it now, three years ago, they did. At that moment in 1933, they didn't. And the subsequent events in both cases would indicate that standing up for one's wider political responsibilities, wider social responsibilities, can be effective. Now, in the context of the Third Reich, the intimidation factor was much higher. Um, there were German industrialists, industrialists in early 1933 who were in, physically intimidated. Uh, I can cite the examples of Paul Heusch, who was the head of a large mining and uh, machinery conglomerate. He owned a newspaper in Munich that the Nazis wanted to control. So they literally seized it uh, in March of 1933. And when Reusch sued to, to stop this, they arrested his lawyers. And they said, basically, we will not let them out of jail unless you agree to the confiscation of the newspaper. And he did. And he was one of the people who resigned on April 6th, 1933, and then suddenly turned into a lamb uh, in political matters. He'd been a very important figure in Weimar politics, and he then became utterly quiescent. That was the intimidation factor. Um, Rem Philip Remsma, who was the owner of the biggest cigarette manufacturer in the company, uh, in, in the country, literally had his company put under a commissar for four months. Um, no, no, threatened with it. And three of his uh, a board of director members were arrested. And he basically could get all of this pressure relieved only by paying a bribe to Hermann Goering. And the last example is, um, is uh, Gunter Quant, who was the owner and, uh, and chief operating officer of the biggest battery maker in the, in the company. He did have a commissar who was inserted to run his operations. He was threatened with arrest. He, he, had to, he, he was arrested. He got out on bail in September 1933. The bail was a million dollars. It was written up in the New York Times. So I've gone on a little long about this, but what I want to stress is that the, there was an intimidation factor that these people succumbed to, which was nothing like that in Trump's America nothing like that in the contemporary conditions, but there's been an enormous development over time in, this, in the role that corporate leaders think they have to play in the political and social developments of their society. 
And on the whole, this has been very much to the good, I think. What the example of the Nazi, of the Nazi situation shows is this myopic concentration on self-interest and the welfare of the firm and, and so forth opens the way for politicians to do terrible things. Thanks, thanks for that. Um, yeah, I mean, it's interesting um, hearing that, and I, I guess some one part of my response would be to um, to like, or one part of the thinking was on these kinds of us, uh, the Stephen Norwood type thing, uh, the book about you know the Third Reich and the Ivory Tower, right? So it, like the responsibilities of say like American corporations or or whatever, or Italian corporations or whatever, or you know who happen or the you've frozen up from no connection oh okay frozen up um yeah it says sorry internet connection is uh unstable apparently i don't know if you can hear me um now right. but well, so, so kind of continuing, yeah. continuing in that vein i guess that was one of the follow-up questions that i did have would be like um you know if you want to talk more about like those kinds of corporations right. um and their uh, responsibilities. But maybe, a, could you say a little bit more too? The other question I had was about the role of universities actually in the ethics of the, the business world's relations with academia, right? I mean, many people talk about the corporatization of the research university, this kind of thing, and this nexus between business and academia. So I, I wonder if we could just have some of your thoughts yeah. and reflections on either the Nazi era or the contemporary moment or however you want to well, I approach Well, I think the, what needs a little more exploration is that the, in the university's connection was often uh, with, between Nazi Germany and uh, American universities was often by way of the popularity of eugenics. In American university structures, there were often people, now their names are being routinely removed from universities across the country at the moment. USC just took the name of a dean off a building because he was a great proponent of eugenics. And eugenics was a very popular notion in intellectual circles in the United States in the 30s. And it made, made Nazi policy, if, if to use a German phrase, salonfähig. It made... Uh, you know, discussable in polite company. And so the persecution of the Jews was viewed by many people in American universities who were themselves prejudiced against Jews here in this country. Uh, it made them think that, oh, the Nazis are not, not so bad. Their racial policies are not so bad. And with the corporations, the tendency was to do business as usual. Um, now, there's an interesting moment in the history of I.G. Farben in the June of 1933. The principal American business partner of I.G. Farben was the DuPont Corporation, the chemical company in Delaware. Uh, two directors of DuPont came to Frankfurt, to I.G. Farben's headquarters in June of 1933, apparently with the intention of discussing divesting themselves of the shares in I.G. Farben. And the leaders of I.G. Farben <clears throat> went out of their way to reassure them. Everything is fine in this country. I mean, yes, we had a little tumult for the first few months of Hitler's rule, but it's, it's settled down. The business climate is much better. We're not as afraid that they will meddle in our operations as we were in the first few months. Therefore, don't, don't sell out, don't leave. And this kind of reassurance in the German business world went a long way in the first phases of Nazism to having American companies treat Germany under the Nazis as just like Germany under the Republic, not no reason to leave and so forth. Now then the Nazis create a number of economic disincentives to leaving. It's, it becomes impossible, I think, um, I think it's uh, in, in 1935, after 1935, it becomes impossible for foreign investors in Nazi Germany to take their money out. You cannot repatriate it. You have, to, you have to reinvest it in the country if you decide not to do something. And this for, um, for any company that had a manufacturing plant in Germany, this became an anchor around their feet. If General Motors had wanted to divest, which they didn't, uh, if Ford had wanted to divest, they would have essentially lost the investment in the Ford plant in Cologne or the Opel plant in uh, Rüsselsheim and they would have had to invest it in something else. And given that the growth sectors of the German economy in the 1930s 
are all military related. You're, you're gonna be implicated no matter what you do. Now, it was easier for companies that had a sales only relationship with Germany. And the, pro, the most prominent example of this is the Hollywood movie distributors and so forth. Only one of those made a principal decision in 1933 to get out of the country, to cease doing business with it all. And that was Warner Brothers. And every other one of those companies, there were several who closed their offices, but then they worked through um, agents in Germany. And there were several that just plain stayed and, and said, we're not giving up the market. So again, the, the tendency was to sort of have a blinkered look on, these, uh, on the situation. What is in our self-interest? And we respond only to that. Um, and that continues right up until Kristallnacht. And then after the open violence, there are signs of more uh, hope, willingness to try to detach. But by then, most of these companies that are nominally American are in fact being run by German managers within the country. The American directors are no longer even coming to meetings. And so those companies become increasingly co-opted. And, and both Ford and General Motors, for instance, start producing trucks for the German military, even though the headquarters had resisted that for a long time. There's probably time for one more question, Patrick, unless you would like to, to hand it over to General q &A. it's up to you. I was, yeah, wondering, um, I'm fine either way. Um, I, we, um, I have lots of, lots of questions about this really fascinating topic, but I'm happy to um, yield the floor if, if there are uh, others we want to get in. Um, and then maybe we, I, I can, if, if people get theirs out, I, I can jump back in maybe with some, some other. That sounds great. Yes, thank you. Okay, so um, we have a question from Sean Darcy initially who says, thanks very much, Professor Hayes, um, and that you lay out some of the various reasons why companies supported by the Nazis um, acted the way they did, but to what extent was intimidation, bullying, and strong arm tactics, et cetera, by the Nazis used to coerce these companies to work with the Nazis? Um, and Sean notes that he doesn't wish in any way to exonerate companies of their own responsibilities, but do you have any thoughts on, on that? Well, I, I cited those examples of Reusch and Reimsmann Quant at the beginning. There are some other examples. Um, the head of Juncker's aircraft, Hugo Juncker's, was basically dispossessed in 1933 because he was he was more interested in producing civilian uh, planes than he was in uh, going into the military market and becoming dependent on the military market. So he was basically dispossessed. Um, there were examples of situations where industrialists crossed the purposes of the regime and they were bullied. Um, in 1934, there was um, an attempt to make increased synthetic fuel production from brown coal. And the brown coal producers were basically ordered by the economics minister to invest in a new company that would build the facilities for this. They were reluctant to do it. They didn't think the civilian market was going to support that company, but they had to do it. There's the famous example of um, the formation of the Hermann Göring Werke to produce iron ore from German domestic supplies. And here, the major mining companies were told that if they didn't participate in investing in the Hermann Göring Werke, they would be charged with sabotage under Nazi laws. There's another example in 1943 where um, Paul Reusch, whom I mentioned before, was reluctant to use forced laborers in his factories. He was basically kicked upstairs. He was, he was removed as head of the managing board of his company. He became the head of the supervisory board. His son was made the managing board head, but the whole thing was a maneuver to make the company behave. And a final example is a man, um, oh, what was the name of the company? Who, who in North Germany, in Lübeck, they produced, Dräger, Drägerwerke. They produced gas masks. And in 1944, when Goebbels wanted to have the, the Volksmaske, that everyone in the country would have a gas mask. So they had to produce massive numbers of these Volksmasken. And Dreger was basically told the workforce he was going to have for the, to do this was going to come from the women's concentration camp at Ravensburg. And he said, no. And they were brought in anyway, and he was basically pushed aside. 
So in there was there was plenty of bullying as the system went on, but you didn't have to bully everybody. You just had to make an example of a few people. Um, in the famous phrase of Voltaire, pour encourager les autres. And this, the message gets out and people do not balk. Thanks so much for that. Um, and thanks, John, for the question. Patricia Guerrero asks um, about the implications of this behavior today. So she asks about the dozens of national conflicts that respond to the needs of globalization and notes that people are often considered disposable, for example, thrown into the sea and possibly disposal, disposable at the borders. Um, I'm not sure if, if that's enough information for you to, to, to answer a question on. I can, I can bring Patricia in with more detail. Um, if, if you want, Professor Hayes, is that is, is that, um, does that make sense to you or shall there, I come back have, to that? There have been recent court cases where uh, have been asked to assert control over the actions of multinationals based in the country of the courts, but actions elsewhere. Uh, the most recent one that I know about has to do with oil companies that have polluted the environment in Nigeria. And that case went all the way to the United States Supreme Court about whether um, American courts would uh, assert jurisdiction over that. Some of the precedents that were invoked were, had to do with the behavior of German corporations in uh, World War II. And I, and I know because I was involved in a friend of the court brief about this. Um, and I believe the outcome of that case was that the court Argue, the court, the United States Supreme Court ruled that the precedent of breaking up IG Farben after 1945 did not was not parallel to this situation of the oil companies and so forth because IG Farben was broken up on defense grounds that it would contribute to the military power of a resurrected Germany. It was not broken up for what it did at Auschwitz because in 1945 when we broke up IG Farben, when the Allies broke up IG Farben we did not yet know what they had done at Auschwitz. So the precedents have not so far, as far as I know, been internationally controlling. Um, but the law of international human rights has developed enormously uh, since Nuremberg. So there are grounds for optimism, I think. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Professor Hayes. Um, Sinead Healy notes that this was so interesting um, and that you made a very interesting point about Warner Brothers being the only firm to pull out at the time. Um, Sinead says that self-interest is a theme that rings true today and can Professor Hayes see this self-interest in today's world and is he frightened by trends to right-wing policies um, and this self-interest in, in the current um, global climate? Uh, I I have spent my life studying Nazi Germany. I'm always frightened. Uh, it just goes with the territory. Uh, this is a subject that brings you face to face with how things can go terribly wrong in a democracy, mm -hmm. then how things can go terribly wrong um, in the context of prejudices and, and uh, obsessions with uh, groups that are depicted as the source of all of our misfortunes. Um, it's it's a story that tells you how terribly wrong immigration policy can go in countries. This is a, you know, there are, there were American senators in the 1930s who said on the floor of the Senate, if I could build a wall around this country, I would. I mean, this is rings very contemporary. So yes, I'm always frightened. Um, on the other hand, um, the, example of Nazi Germany or of, or of Imperial Japan uh, is an example of what happens when nations follow such beliefs and attitudes and, um, and worship themselves, which is fundamentally what the Nazis did. They worship themselves. Um, as I've written in another context, the Catholic Church got a great deal wrong about Nazi Germany, but one thing it got right was that Nazism was a form of idolatry. It was a form of self-worship. And nations that give themselves over to that are going to end badly. Thank you. And um, in terms of, I suppose, consequences for this type of behavior, Mackenzie Common asks, do you think that companies should be prosecuted for international 
crimes and that's going into the legal territory, but I'm sure you have thoughts on what the consequences should be. Well, well I do. Mm -hmm. uh, I do wish that they could be. On the other hand, one needs to take that with a grain of salt because I've not thought through as a legal scholar would all the consequences of that being a, a, an operative principle. Mm -hmm. But I do think that um, accountability is good for everybody. And be, the, so all of us in every way, firms, individuals, and so forth, we, there has to be a mechanism to hold us accountable. And so in principle, I favor that. Mm -hmm. Thanks, and thanks, Mackenzie, for the question. Um, there's time for another question from yourself, Patrick, if you wanted to jump in on that. Yeah, I mean, thanks, Donna. Maybe I could um, just jump back in with a, a question for Peter um, in, in terms of like um, budding um, historians or uh, others are out there who are interested in really talking about, I mean, this. Um, what's your methodology for how do you go about you know, writing this uh, business history of a very inflammatory topic People are very passionate about this, but you know, could you give for the budding, um, you know, scholars out there? Could you give them some principles about, uh, you know, how you both bring this material alive, treat it responsibly, and you know, also insert yourself or not into these kind of moral and ethically charged issues? Well, um, you know, the, I, I I try very hard not to well the old the old historical aphorism is always show don't tell so what i try to do is show and leave readers to draw the conclusion of what these actions meant or ways in which these actions admonish uh, or how we should behave in the world so so you know i try to, i try to do this with as light a hand as i can um and I also try to pre preserve a calm tone of voice that because I don't believe in it be, in being inflammatory <clears throat> leads to anywhere very productive. So those are the principles I operate in. Now, it's, it's hard to do um, because this is a subject about which people have passions. Um, in, in our world, when I started out doing this and started do, writing about this stuff in the 1970s, we were a much more um, ideologically polarized intellectual world. You know, were you for or against Marx? Were you for or against Freud? You know, this kind of thing. That has all mellowed out. So I, have, I don't get a lot of criticism nowadays for having whitewashed corporate executives who really were just greedy pigs. Um, but we all remain passionate about who the good actors and bad actors in politics are, and this occasionally intrudes. I just try to keep that at arm's length. And I think um, you can, people will give you the benefit of the doubt if you seem to be acting in good faith and trying to present um, the evidence in all of its fullness and complexity. Um, so that's, that was, that's the real operating principle. Now, I think, I also think the kind of work I've done is really first generation work. And the next generation is gonna process this material very differently. I mean, this book, when I wrote about Aji Farben and Degusa, I was writing out of the bowels of an archive and really putting together all of this detailed material that had never seen the light of day, really. I mean, it had never been, related to each other in a convincing way. So I had to do that kind of first generation work. Now with this, and when I started on Prophets and Persecution, I thought it was going to be a book like that. I thought I was going to have to spend a long sabbatical year in whatever archives would be open to me to pull all this together. Well, that was 25 years ago and the avalanche of literature about firms in Germany and to some degree in occupied France um, and it, even in occupied Denmark, I mean, the, the avalanche of this literature, if I were to shift my computer just a little to the left, you would see probably 15 linear feet of corporate histories. Now my job is to synthesize what all of this first generation literature means, to bring together examples from across the board of German companies so that one can see the broad pattern. And that will be, I think, my contribution to the second generation, 
And then we will see what goes beyond that. Your, your line of questioning suggests what goes beyond that, which is the internationalization of this, the way in which this becomes transnational. And here, you know, there are, there are companies, there are countries that have done more corporate histories where you can begin to see these things across national lines. The United States is very retrograde in this um, because unlike uh, Germany, the archives have not been flung open for most American corporations and they have resist, they continue to resist it. Whereas for Germany now, the most laggard firms, the very last one, Vint Vintas Hall is a big important contemporary com company. Henkel is a family owned company in Dusseldorf. They have just finally commissioned histories, opened their archives to professional historians. But, um, and I think probably in the UK, there's, it's a kind of middle position. Some of them have done it. Years ago, Imperial Chemical Industries did it, but there is still, it's more like America where you can't actually get in and see the gears at work. Um, and so there's a lot of room for this to be made transnational. Thanks so much, it's absolutely fascinating. And I just have one final question, if you don't mind, um, if you haven't already answered this, but in terms of this, this piece of scholarship from, um, Profits and sorry, profits and persecution. How do you, where do you see that this situation um, amongst your other books? So, industry and ideology, or German railroads, Jewish souls, uh, from corporation to complicity. Where does this work uh, fit in to to those other works? Well, it's the capstone of the business history work, but it will resemble more my book on the Holocaust than my monographs because it is more a synthetic work that is paints with a broad brush, highlights themes, that sort of thing. The Railroads book um, is an interesting example of how you know, business history can spill over into something else because I, <clears throat> I, I did that book and uh, Chris Browning and I did that book partly as an homage to Ralph Hilberg, but also partly because <clears throat> I have always, in, in working on corporations, I had to learn to be comfortable with numbers. And I had to learn how to analyze numbers. And um, the root of that book uh, uh, on the railroads is that I was mortally offended by another book, which uh, wrote about the role of German railroads in the Holocaust and had absolutely no quantitative perspective. And so I felt motivated to say that one of the myths about the Holocaust is that conducting it diverted a lot of resources from the German war effort or, or so forth. Nothing about the Holocaust diverted anything from the German war effort or from the German economy as a whole. The Holocaust made money. The Germans profited from the Holocaust. And the fraction of German resources devoted to killing people was infinitesimal. And this, this shows in particular high relief when you look at the small number of trains involved in deporting 3 million people. It's, it's stunning how small a percentage of German railroad traffic that was. It's also stunning how small a percentage of Zyklon produced between 1941 and 1944 was actually used to kill people. It's about 1% of the total production. So, and I think the scale of this shows you something horrifying, but illuminating. And that is societies bent on destruction can do it with very little application of resources or effort. It's, it is not hard to massacre. And, and that is a truly chilling thought. Yes. In spite of that, we're very much looking forward to reading the forthcoming book, uh, Profits of Persecution, German Big Business and the Holocaust. It sounds absolutely fascinating. And I just wanted to thank you so much, Professor Hayes, for joining us today. And thanks also to Dr. Houlihan and to everybody for joining and for asking such interesting questions. Um, Professor Hayes, you're such a, an influential thinker and a prolific scholar. And this book obviously touches on such important issues relating to how corporations were implicated in the policies pursued in Nazi Germany. Um, and as I say, we're all very much looking forward to, to reading the textbook when it comes out soon. Um, we're so grateful to have had the opportunity to speak to you about your scholarship today. Um, and if there's anything else you'd like to raise before we wrap up, feel free. If not, I, I can finish. Thank you very much. Next time in Dublin.
Absolutely. Very much looking forward to that. And we'll keep okay. you to that. Thanks again, Patrick. Right. Thanks, Professor. Thanks very much, everyone. Thank you. Take good care. Thank Thanks. you.